Hello, good afternoon, and we welcome you to The Abundant Life with Pastor Jonathan McLean. This is a one-hour program produced right here in the WCNO studios, coming to you from Abundant Life Assembly of God Church. The church address is Abundant Life Ministries, P.O. Box 1349, Stewart, Florida, 34995. Our church phone number is 772-220-0602. And we do welcome you today, and I believe we have the Grishans joining us right now at this time. Uh, Joe, are you with us? We are. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Good morning, Alexa. That sounds like you're there as well. How are you all with all of the babies and (laughs) grown-ups? We're good. We're doing really good. Very good. Great to have you with us. Uh, Open up our uh, time today uh, with what the Lord's put in your heart and with prayer. Okay. Um, Honey, you want to share a little bit? Well, as we know, it's Memorial Weekend. Um, my my husband went to law school um, a few years back here now, probably four years, I guess. Um, maybe five, five years ago. <laughs> Anyways, whatever. We were at, and in anticipating going. I was nervous because I had heard that um, when they went to, when men or whatever went to law school. They were to really absent from the home, and I was really nervous with the idea of that because at the time I had three children, and I was just nervous about doing it by myself, and I never wanted to marry somebody that left for work. I just wanted to be able to, you know, do life with someone, and then very quickly, we were in law school in Virginia, um, Virginia Beach, which is right next to Norfolk, which is one of the biggest naval bases in, in the U.S., and I quickly met a lot of uh, women whose spouses were in the military. I remember one family in particular, her husband would be gone for six months, home for two, and then gone oh. for another six months, and wow. I met her through homeschooling. And I quickly realized how selfish mm. and how much of a baby I was being, because I realized how many men and women sacrifice their family members for the sake of our nation, and how wonderfully um, thankful I am for that. And so today, I think in remembering those who have passed away, it's really important to remember the families that are still here, the, the children Amen. and the mothers and, the, and the, um, the wives that hold up the fort while the men go away. And sometimes even the women go away. And so it's a big thing. It's a big sacrifice, a sacrifice that the entire family makes on behalf of our freedoms that we're so thankful for. And I just, that just really rose up in my heart today. It's just, I, if you're out there and you've served in the military, it's not a light thing. And we take it, we do not take it for granted, the freedoms that you fought for. We're very thankful. And for those moms and wives that are out there and families and children that have sacrificed as well through um, the sharing of their loved ones, um, you have done an amazing service for our nation. And I'm very thankful. So um, here's Jeff. Praise God. Very true. Um, there's, a, there's a Memorial Day tribute. Um, there's a Memorial Day tribute video that um, Hillsdale College puts on. Um, and if you type that in, uh, Memorial Day tribute, it is about a three and a half minute video that talks about um, the service members and what they've gone through and what they've donated to, uh, what they've given for the cause of, of, of our country. And today what God's put in our heart is hope. Um, Soldiers go to war in the hope that they'll come home, but in the hope that they're fighting for the right cause, they're fighting for freedom. Mm -hmm. And we put our hope in um, the salvation of God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we know that we have such a great hope in that that, um, resurrection of Christ. We found, we, we, we base our lives on it. And so today as we celebrate Um, the cause of freedom. We celebrate uh, what God's done in this nation and our military members um, and their families. We also want to reflect that with the backdrop that our ultimate hope is the resurrection that we have in Jesus Christ. Um, And so, Father, we just thank you so much for your grace and your mercy, that which you've given for us. We thank you for your great plan of salvation. We thank you for this, this marvelous country um, we ask your peace. As, as your word says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We do so, and we also pray for the peace of America you, and ultimately Lord. the world um, when Jesus sets up his kingdom. And so, Father, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. Um, we ask you to give pastor the words to say and give us all ears to hear and eyes to see what 
the Spirit of God is saying to us. Um, we thank you for this day in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Uh, our blessings go out to you, Joe and Alexa, and to all of your family. We thank God for you, for your ministry, for your service, and uh, for the great witness of your life. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank we you. are going to come back to you, Rachel, for just a moment. We want to take about, talk about uh, what's going on with ladies. And uh, we're, get, we're, we're hopeful to get the church open back up very shortly. So yes. maybe you can give a bit of a report on that. Let me get your mic on there. You are on. <laughs> okay. Yes, we certainly are. And uh, we certainly have missed fellowshipping with everyone. Uh, we are lifting up prayer requests. We are praying with the ladies on Tuesdays. We meet at 6 o'clock. And we have uh, continued to meet. And we also are meeting on our Wednesday evening Bible studies. And we're coming together, praying, hearing, and sharing from the Word and uh, lifting up the needs so if you have a prayer request please just let us know you can let us know that by going online and uh, sending your prayer request to us and we would appreciate you doing that so very much and i have spoke uh, with our contact with the flagler center yes and wanted to just make mention of that, that we expect to hear an update on Tuesday this week. And as soon as we hear what date we're able to get back into the facilities, we will certainly be letting you know. I believe we plan to make a lot of phone calls. Yes. Uh, is that right, Rachel? <laughs> yes. A lot of phone calls. And um. in addition to that, we will also be sending out a letter uh, to all of our families that's on the mailing list. And... Um, we will endeavor to keep you all abreast of, uh, of the date of reopening. Wouldn't it be great if we could be in uh, our facilities there at the Flagler Center again next week? That would be great if that could happen. It is possible, but we do not have a clear um, go-ahead yet. We're waiting on a report that's going to come in on Tuesday. So if for some reason... You are looking for an update. We may not have your phone number. You may have been listening. You may be interested in joining us for services. Then once again, honey, give that phone number because okay. uh, people will be able to go online. They'll yes. be able to see where Flagler Center is, what time our services are. But if you want to get additional information, as we have had some people calling, and so you can call uh, the church phone number, and we'll be happy to assist you. One more time with that number. Yes, the number is 772-220-0602. All right, and uh, we now have, I believe, Ruddy on the phone. Ruddy, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you, Pastor. Okay, and Ruddy and Jasmine, uh, we're looking for a big update. Uh, you're not in your new house yet, right? Not yet. But coming, soon come. It's coming soon, coming soon. S soon come, okay. Well, we love you all. We're keeping you lifted up in prayer, and I know that uh, we're, uh, uh, we're trying to assist uh, with whatever uh, housewarming things that you may need as you all are preparing to move into your home. I know there's some furniture needed and some other things. And so if you all can kind of get us a okay. list together, then we'll let our people know. And uh, if you're part of our family or you're listening today and you have a house full of furniture and you mm -hmm. have, uh, you'd like to, to bless uh, Ruddy and Jasmine, a family in our congregation, part of our ministry team, then you can call the church office with that as well. Mm -hmm. We're looking to make sure they have everything they need when they move yes. in because they're a huge blessing to us and we want to be a blessing to you all as well, Ruddy. All right, you always lead us in uh, in our giving time, so go ahead and share with us. Good morning, Pastor and Sister Rachel and to members of the studio team this morning. And to the church on air, we worship this morning Amen. with the hope that someday soon we will meet Jesus in the air. I just want to refer this morning to... Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 2, which says, when thou, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. We take comfort this morning in the fact that the God that we serve is the omnipresent God. 
he assure us and continue to assure us that his abiding presence will always be with us. In this particular time that we are going through, a time in which individual members are confined, they are isolated, they are restricted, they are shut in and unable to have the fellowship and the communion that we would normally have as a family of believers. This morning, you might just feel alone. I'm here this morning to remind you that the God we serve is the God who will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Amen. And he said to the children of Israel then, which is now being made applicable to us as a church, his presence is with us. He Amen. will never leave us. And it doesn't matter what you're going through. Someone might be going through the waters of their life. You might be going through the fire. You might be in the middle of some, you know, midnight crisis. You, you might be facing your Goliath. I'm here this morning to remind you that the God of the Bible is with you and you are not alone. Amen. So as we prepare to give this morning, here's a God who offers his presence to us. His divine presence is being offered to each and every one this morning. And so, as God's people, we are about to give our gift unto the Lord. And so, let us just look to him in prayer, knowing that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we recognize this morning that you are the initiator of giving. You are the first who give. And Lord, you gave us life. You gave us a creation. Lord God, most of all, you gave us your son, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we come at a point where we're about to give back to you. And so, Lord, we, we are giving, rejoicing in the fact, Lord God, that you are our God who continues to give unto us. Amen. And Lord, throughout the past week, you would have blessed us in so many ways. We would be unable, Lord, to, to identify the, the various ways in which you have blessed us. And so this morning, out of a heart of appreciation and gratitude to you, we express as part of our worship our tithe and offering in giving unto you this morning. Thank so Lord, we ask that you will receive that which we will be giving unto you this morning. And as we give, Lord God, that Father, our giving will be, O oh God, used to your glory, and that you will be pleased with that which we shall give unto you. We commit every giver, every worshiper listening this morning and ear into your care, Lord God, in no other name but the name of our Lord Jesus Amen. Christ, who promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Ruddy. Give our love to your family. And uh, I, I trust you all are well, and we thank God for you and uh, your partnership and ministry among us. At thank this you, time, uh, Rachel, maybe you can mention about um, the midweek service and just give okay. a little information about that. And also, once again, give the information on how someone uh, can give if they want to give. Okay. And I'm, uh, I believe we're going to have uh, Bob Warner with us maybe in just a few moments. And all right. um, he'll join us just before the message. Okay. All right, very well. If you would like to give, when you go to the website, www.abundantlifestuart.com, that's www.abundantlifestuart.com, you can give right down below. There's a little donate button under the video, and it will take you to a secure PayPal giving website. And that is how you can give, or you can mail in your um, offerings to Abundant Life Ministries, P.O. Box 1349, Stewart, Florida, 34995. Right, so up. those are several ways that you can do that. Okay. And we thank those who have been giving and bringing them by the station and also mailing them in, and we really, truly appreciate that so much. And Wednesday nights... Uh, if you're interested in attending, you can call the church phone, 772-220-0602, and we can plug you right into the information and our location and where we will be. All right. And once again, if we are able 
if we're able to be back at the Flagler Center, which is in downtown Stewart, Florida, if we are able to be back there this coming Sunday, we will let you know. Yes. We do not have uh, approval yet, but we are anticipating a response uh, very soon uh, that will come to us uh, through the count, through the city. And as soon as we get that information, we will let you know. And in the case, um, if next Sunday, if, if God gives us favor in such a way to where we're able to get back together by this coming Sunday, then we will be streaming next Sunday. Yes. And we'll be streaming from the Flagler Center instead of from WCNO Radio. Correct. The part that we don't know is whether or not we will have uh, one more broadcast or something here on the air. But in any case, uh, we will keep you posted. We will be giving uh, announcements and uh, we'll have uh, promotional spots here on WCNO to let you know exactly what has taken place with Abundant Life Ministries as far as our services. Now it's good to have Bob Warner with us. Uh, Bob, I know you are a veteran. You served uh, our country and we thank God for that and for all of our veterans today. And I wanted you to specifically just uh, share with us for a few moments and maybe uh, pray over our families that are impacted by their service and participation. Uh, in the military in some way. Good afternoon on this memorable Memorial Day of 2020. So much is going on. I was out this morning uh, to go on over to McDonald's, get a cup of coffee, and saw a, a veteran Marine mm. from the uh, late 60s and 70s. He, to me, it sounded like he had served almost 10 years, and it was great to see him. And the reason I'm so grateful for all our veterans is I was reminded by what the president had said the other day, that we have the right to assemble, our constitutional Amen. right to assemble in churches. And uh, Brian Mast, our representative from this area, he had mentioned yesterday on Fox in an op-ed, it said that so many veterans, and he being one, served abroad. They left their friends and their family. They went abroad, and uh, while they were uh, living out of, uh, like, tractor-trailer type structures in the, the jungles in the forest they couldn't help but think every day what it would be like if they could come back home mm. to the freedom that we have here so we're just so Amen. grateful when you think of it from their perspective going out and serving there are men and women abroad even now uh in in secret service in some of them in threatening uh situations uh, they're remembering the freedom they had. They have family members at home. They're families that are home watching kids and households and uh, parents and children and grandchildren. Uh, all are involved in making sure that they uh, continually stay in touch with their service members. So we do lift up all our service members. You know, the Word of God said in John 15, said in the 15th verse of chapter 15 there that, uh, he doesn't call us, God doesn't call us servants, because servants don't know what their Lord's doing, but he calls us friends. And it says in the 13th verse, a greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. So I just want to pray for all of Thank those you. that are out there that, are, that have served, that are listening to this broadcast. If their family members are listening and they can get a word out to them today, don't neglect the, the uh possibility of making contact with a service member that you've known uh, that you could reach today and tell them how much you're Amen. grateful for the freedom that they preserved and helped through the guarantees of our Constitution to uphold. And uh, many may not have known that when they went abroad to serve, but I'm praying that many uh, did hear from the Word of God and did understand what the price of freedom was. And so we thank you, Lord, for you, uh, giving your life as well for every one of us and calling us friends. You call us friends. And we're just so grateful for this time. Very memorable time that we have right now. We don't want it to be forgotten. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding us always about the friendship we have with Christ and what it means to be protected by our fellow citizens. God bless them all. Amen. Amen. And Bob, uh, perhaps you could give us an update on what's taking place with our men. I know that uh, we're continuing to get together. You bet. Uh, met together yesterday morning, and uh, 
had a great representative turnout of guys. We did. We uh, were moving along together in our friendship and communication. We shared the word. We're sharing out of Timothy. And thank you, Pastor, for bringing uh, those scriptures to our remembrance yesterday morning. And it, what a great opportunity to have a little breakfast, uh, have some communion with each other, per se, and talk about other things in our lives and lift each, each other's prayers up, um, the needs that we have to lift them up. And the prayer is, is uh, the tools that the Lord has given us to lift up our brothers. And again, on Monday nights, we meet together for prayer, uh, see such miracles take place. Uh, intervention by the Lord, jobs are are uh, found. Maybe God has a better job for an individual. Maybe he they need a guidance, miracles, answers to prayer, healings, prosperity, victory over situations, families restored, marriages restored. Amen. There's so much I could go on and on and on. But those are the freedoms that we have. We thank you, Lord, for giving us that freedom. Amen. In Jesus' name only and in his name only. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, Bob and Esther, we love you all. God bless you. Have a, uh, have a wonderful rest of your day today. And um, thanks for uh, calling in and connecting in with us here today. You got it. I, and I want to hear what the Lord has in store for us. So we're looking forward to this message today, Pastor. God Amen. bless you, Thank and you. Rachel. Thank and you. And the staff there. And all the sound people and techs. We just speak a blessing over them as well. Thank you, guys. God bless. Thanks, Bob. Later. <laughs> and we are going to be having more updates in the very near future in reference to development of our new church property. This is exciting, honey. It's very exciting to realize after all these years we purchased this property in 2001 and uh, i i believe some may have lost a little little heart in the process it's yes. taken us a while to get to where we are but we have permits in hand and we're in the process right now of the last details of getting the shop drawings together for all the drainage that's going to be on the site. And, the, you know, when you're in a parking lot and you see all of these concrete uh, drain structures that uh, the water runs off into, those are all custom made, of course, to a project. And ours, uh, the drawings are in the process of, of being uh, completed and approved. And once those are approved, production is going to start immediately on those. And uh, our lift station for water, for the sewage, uh, fire hydrants, all of that is in the works. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's very exciting in just a few days when you drive by the corner of Willoughby and Salerno Road. This is the northwest corner. Um, this is going to be our future worship center and worship facility, our new campus. And we, when people ask me, well, where is your church? I, I have to kind of say we're a bit of a homeless church right now. Uh, <laughs> we rent facilities yes. downtown at the Flagler Center, and we thank God for those facilities. They're beautiful. Yes, they are. It's a beautiful location. We're just down close to Mulligan's, mm -hmm. and uh, the facilities work great. We have uh, tremendous teachers that teach our children, and we have a great uh, great worship, worship team, great ushers. We have a great, uh, great time of fellowship, and we are so looking forward, my wife wife and I uh, are so looking forward to being reunited with you, our family. And of course, I know there's going to be some guidelines uh, and such forth, but we have enough space that we can safely, I'm confident, uh, bring the body of Christ together there at that facility. So we will let you know uh, just as soon as we know that we're able to get back into our facilities there. At this time, I'd like you to just join me as we look into the Word of God. And I want to uh, join in with, uh, with Bob and uh, Joe, who also made an emphasis on this Memorial uh, Weekend, Memorial Day weekend. And we thank God for all of you, all of, you, your, all of our families that have, uh, have just dedicated portions of their life as well as their very lives so that we might have the freedom to worship as we have it today. And I, I just have to say this. I was so thrilled to see our president putting the emphasis 
on churches having the right to worship and wanting to see the churches open back up and urging the governors across the United States to no longer stand in the way of churches getting back into their facilities and restoring worship. And he said something, and uh, honey, I, I don't know if you heard him say this, but he said, we need more prayer in America. Yes. And I, I thought that is absolutely is the case. More we, prayer, not less. More, more <laughs> prayer, not less. All right. So uh, now Josh is with us, and uh, I believe, because I, I can see my wife, I believe that you are able to see Rachel today. Is that the case? Did that happen? <laughs> Uh, so she is. She has been alive with me this morning a little bit. So there she's been. Okay, very good, honey. It's great to have you back from your surgeries and on the mend. And every day I can see that you're doing much better. Thanks for your prayers, incidentally, for those of you who have been praying with us. Now, as you know, Pentecost Sunday is coming up on the 31st, and last Sunday we began a series looking at Pentecost, and um, today I want to continue that series. I want to pick up with a topic that is Pentecost now, the possibility. Now, I know Pentecost Sunday took place about 2,000 years ago, but the question is, is Pentecost now a possibility in your life, in my life as believers? And if so, what exactly does Pentecost look like? Why was there a Pentecost? What took place on that day? Why did Jesus say to the disciples, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. I want you to tarry there until you have received the promise. And of course, this promise comes uh, from the Father. And this is the gift that Christ promised to the church. If you recall when John, we call him John the Baptist because he baptized many people. But when he was baptizing, if you recall what he said when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And the disciples of John would say to him, John, do you realize that more and more of those who have been coming and listening, being baptized, been following you and your teachings, do you realize more and more are beginning to follow Jesus? And of course, John would say, uh, this is the way it must be. I must decrease and he must increase. And he spoke about the baptism in water, which was a baptism that tied in with regeneration. Uh, He spoke of that baptism that what he was doing was a baptism unto repentance. It was a baptism by which one would, uh, would publicly declare and publicly participate as a believer and demonstrate before the watching world that Jesus Christ was Lord in their life. That is what it means to us today. And of course, uh, it is a tremendous part of our uh, journey as a newborn Christian. We're instructed to do so. However, John said that Jesus would baptize with a different baptism. That his baptism was not simply going to be like the baptism that John had, a baptism of repentance, but that his baptism would be with fire, that it would be a uh, cleansing, purifying, transforming uh, baptism of fire. And we know on the day of Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit descended. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus as a dove as he was baptized there in the Jordan. However, to the believers as they are in that upper room, the Holy Spirit descended upon them, and the Scriptures tell us that there was this mighty wind that blew. There were tongues, as it were, of fire that came upon those who were in the room, and we know that their speech was transformed on that, mo- on that day at that time as well because it tells us that they spoke in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, and those who heard were able to hear in their native uh, tongue, their native language, rather than just in the language of the speaker. 
A miracle took place that day. Those who spoke, spoke with a new tongue uh, that was inspired and moved by the Holy Spirit. And those who heard, also heard by the power of the Holy Spirit in a wonderful way. So Pentecost now, is it possible? I believe we are going to see in the Scripture that it's not only possible, but it is the gift that God the Father has for every believer. Pentecost now, it's not only a possibility, we're going to see that it is the will of God. Last Sunday morning or afternoon, I was speaking of the fact that in my own personal life, I had a holy desire to be holy. I believe that is to be the norm in the individual's life who has surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. When when you talk with someone who says they're a Christian, but there is absolutely no evidence in their life that they have been born into the family of God, there uh, are not any changes, there is not any difference in uh, their appetite for the things of God. We've talked about this some, uh, that if you're truly born again, there's going to be an appetite for the things of God. Um, The Word talks about all things changing and becoming new, that being born again is a brand new relationship. You're brought into the family of God. You're going to desire the Word of God. You're going to desire fellowship with other believers. You're going to desire to be a worshiper. You're going to desire to follow Christ and to honor Him as Lord of your life. And part of that entire work of God is to give us this desire, this hunger, I believe, to be holy. I shared last week some of the struggles in my life, how I'd busied myself with works, uh, thinking maybe that would help, but there always seemed to be uh, uh, areas that were uh, areas that that I was burdened with and uh, displeased and felt as though God was displeased, seemed to be just constantly failing in something and really good at failing, incidentally. A man some years ago came into my office at the church, and he said, Jonathan, could you share with me what is the secret of God's favor on your life? And I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. He's standing there. He's asking me that question. And uh, he went on to elaborate a little bit. He said, I, I know it's not because you're so smart because I don't see you as that, uh, that smart. And uh, he gave me a few other uh, uh, flattering comments at that time. But then he said, but I am confident that God's favors on your life. And the first thing that came to my mind was was what I shared, and I still stand by it, that though in my life I have I, I have been very good at failing, I have learned that a quick return to the Father and honesty and transparency is absolutely the way to live in God's favor. Now, we're going to be talking about the Spirit-filled life and what it means a little more in the days to come. And so uh, let's just move on a little beyond this. So as I was desiring to somehow see a change in my life, I busied myself in all kinds of good works. Not a thing wrong with good works. If you're truly saved, your salvation's going to work. But that is not salvation, nor is it the Spirit-filled life in and of itself. I also dedicated myself to educational development, desiring to learn, desiring to, uh, to understand, and became a student pursuing, reading, studying those who had spent their life desiring to live a holy life. I also talked about uh, the frustrations in my life and just kind of dropping the standard and saying maybe the only way to actually... Uh, actually live at peace in my own life and with God and to live what I would consider to be a holy life. Maybe I need to just lower the standard and say uh, the, the way to do that is just not to expect so much. And that certainly was not the answer either. And one thing I failed to mention last week, but I want to throw it out today, I pursued discipline in my life. And discipline can be a wonderful thing. But someone can be very disciplined and still not be righteous or godly or holy. And, you know, discipline in prayer, discipline in the the garden. If you remember the disciples, the disciples 
had a, uh, a difficult time staying awake. In fact, they dozed off while Jesus is praying, and Jesus asked them to watch and pray that they enter not into temptation, but they dozed off. And so the discipline, having a discipline to do all of these things, the Pharisees had disciplines. They counted out the seeds. They did all of these various rigorous attempts to fulfill the law. And yet, all of the discipline, if you could have all of the discipline you desire, that in and of itself, none of these things in and of themselves can make us holy. It really must totally be a work of God that's done in our life. And so the question, is it it possible? Is it possible to have Pentecost now? To have a life that is filled with the presence of God? Is it possible to have a tongue that is changed, to have a mind that is is set on God? Is it possible to have a life and a lifestyle that is transformed by the power of God, God working in you, God living in you, you living in God? Is this possible? And so I know throughout history many have asked this question, And I'm happy to tell you that the Word of God gives us some answers. I want to start with, first of all, some admonitions that we're going to see. And the first one is to be holy. To be holy. In Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, we find these words recorded. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire Assembly of Israel, say to them, be holy, be holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. You say, well, that's in Leviticus. That's uh, still under the law. That is in the, uh, some might say, the Old Testament. I like to say it's in the first covenant. And yes, it is. It is. But uh, you, you may ask the question, is there any admonition in the New Testament to be holy? Well, we're moving in that direction. Let me share another passage that is from the book of Leviticus as well, but this is in chapter 20. We started in 19. Now we're in chapter 20. We're looking at verse 22. Keep all my decrees and laws and follow them so that the land where I'm bringing you to live may not vomit you out. You must not live according to the customs of, of the nations I'm going to drive out before you. Because they did all these things, I abhorred them. Now listen to verse 26. You are to be holy to me, because I, the Lord, am holy. Did you hear that? God is saying, you are to be holy to me, because I, the Lord, am holy, and I set you apart. That's really what being holy means. It means to be set apart from Satan, from death, from hell, from destruction, and set apart unto God, unto life, and unto righteousness. And, of course, that is eternal life with the Lord. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy, And I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. In Christ, as born-again believers today, are we not chosen? Are we not called? Are we not also to be in Christ? Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and following. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Perhaps you remember those days in ignorance. I call them B.C. days before Christ. The evil desires that you had at that time. But just as he who called you, this is verse 15, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. 
Now, that's where we really need to take note of what the Scriptures is saying to us this morning. The admonition of God is that just as in the first covenant, now God is speaking to us, but now we're in a different place. We now can have uh, the born-again experience with Jesus Christ, and we can have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And this is the will of God that we're holy just as God is holy. This is just amazing. It's overwhelming. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. In other words, Remember that this world is not your home. We used to sing that song. This world is not not my home. I'm just passing through. And this is exactly what the Scripture says, that we are to remember that we are foreigners here with reverent fear, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So again, the admonition, here we are. In the New Testament, in 1 Peter, just as we see it in Leviticus, is that we are to be set apart, but now through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, because we have been purchased with a price, and as God is holy, we are to be holy. And this is be holy. Now let's move to the next admonition. Be perfect. (laughs) Now you're going to laugh about that and say, that's impossible. How in the world can anybody be holy and how in the world can anybody be perfect? Well, it it, it certainly is not going to be possible in our natural flesh and in all of our good works to accomplish these things that God desires to accomplish in our life. Let me take you right to Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not the pagans do that? And then verse 48, here it is. Be perfect, therefore. Wow, that's a big admonition. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What in the world is God talking about when these kind of instructions are given to us in the church? I'm familiar with the point that I've heard many in church say, well, really, we are forever destined to sin and word, thought, and deed every day and make such a focus of it that to some, they actually make that their lifestyle. This does not sound like what the Word of God is instructing us to have as our vision and our goal and our lifestyle. No, be holy as God is holy. Be perfect as our our Heavenly Father is perfect. The admonition is to not respond to our enemies as as unbelievers do, but we're to pray for them and to not be living as the unrighteous live, uh, greeting each other, uh, having relationships on that kind of a level? No, because Christ is in us, and God desires to fill us with his Holy Spirit, which is Pentecostal power. God desires for his church to be a set-apart, transformed, empowered people, very different from what religion can do. This is the journey that God brings us on wherein we become his righteousness. But not only are we admonished to be holy, to be perfect, let me throw another word at you. Be sanctified. 
be sanctified. Well, that's a word that I heard a lot about growing up in the Methodist church, the Wesleyan Holiness uh, churches. Focus on sanctification. Spoke about a second definite work of grace in our life wherein one could be entirely sanctified. Now, the process of sanctification, the Wesleyan holiness, uh, uh, well, along with the Wesleys, desired and believed that it was possible after you're born again to have this, this uh, experience, this encounter, this life-changing encounter with God, wherein you become entirely set apart unto God, sanctified by a work that God does in your life. And some believe that it not only is a second definite work, but it takes place at a specific time, and then it continues. We would call that uh, progressive, that the sanctifying work of God that begins in our life uh, at that time wherein one is sanctified or set apart unto God continues as they journey through the remainder of their days. Now, when we look at Pentecost, we see a definitive time in the disciples' lives where things changed, where their lives are set apart unto God without question in a tremendous, greater, significant manner, and we see a tremendous change not only in their words but also in their lifestyle. And Pentecost now, Pentecost now, God's Holy Spirit baptizing his people, indwelling his church, is the means by which Acts 1.8 can be fulfilled. Acts 1.8, you check it out in the Word of God, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, the whole idea of a witness is someone who has experienced firsthand and can share with someone else what has taken place. And so when we Look at Acts 1.8. This is what the work of the Holy Spirit, the baptism, Pentecost, is to do in the life of the believer. We are to experience God in such a way that we can witness for God and witness of God's power and witness of the faithfulness of God's Word that takes place through the believer's life. This is a spirit energized, a spirit-filled, a spirit-baptized, a spirit-transformed way of living. And so we have be, be holy, be perfect, be sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. As for the other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. That really is the point. How do we please God? As in fact, you are living. Well, the believers there were living that way. He just commends them. Now, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. Continue, he is saying, to grow in your pleasing lifestyle and relationship that you have with God. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Here it is. Be sanctified. Be holy, be perfect, and be sanctified. Be set apart. And then gives a list of exactly what being set apart unto God looked like and becomes very specific. And the uh, the author here, the Holy Spirit, is giving us in 1 Thessalonians 4, when we get to verse uh, 4, verse 3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid First thing, sexual immorality. Well, what do you think about that? Well, it doesn't really matter what you think about that. What matters is God says that he wants us to be set apart and to live a life of morality. Sexual immorality is not to be a part of the church, of the believer. This is not to be a part of our lifestyle. Now, I know many churches may not address this, and some today may say, well, you know, I'm not going to talk about LGBT. I'm not going to talk about homosexuality. I'm not going to talk about adultery. I'm not going to talk about affairs. I'm not going to talk about premarital sex. Well, the Word of God addresses it and says that it is the will of God for us to be sanctified, set apart from the world. And this is in the Word of God, that you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. 
Let me tell you, God is the one that can bring discipline and control to our bodies so that we have a holy and honorable life in this house that we live in. Verse 5, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that is this and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Very specific. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. And listen to verse 7. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Well, we're to be sanctified, set apart unto God. God desires for us to live a holy life, a moral life, a clean life, a pure life, a set apart life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? You may say, wait a minute, wait a minute, pastor, what are you talking about? Because all of us, you know, that no, no one is going to be able to please God. Well, that's contrary to the word of God. The word of God says, be holy, to be perfect, to be sanctified. Now you cannot do this on your own, but the power that God desires to release in your life as a believer and a Christ follower is the power, the same power that brought Jesus up out of the grave, I might say, is the power that God gives us to separate us from the power of sin and destruction. Listen to what it says in this passage. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that, listen to verse 11, and that is what some of you were. Now he's making a clear delineation. He's saying this at one time may have been a part of your life. Maybe one of these sins, maybe many of these sins, maybe all of these sins were a part of your life. But he is saying that this is what some of you were. This is not to be the condition of the church today. The church is to be set apart unto righteousness, apart from sin, apart from destruction, apart from Satan, and set apart unto God. It says, but that's what some of you were. But listen to this. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, we just have a few moments left and I know that we actually started the program today about five minutes late, uh, late so we're going to go ahead and utilize the remainder of that time. But I want to just close by sharing this. My wife and I had not been married a long time, just uh, maybe a few months. When I was talking with her brother, David, about this desire in my heart to be holy, to live a life that is set apart unto God, sanctified, and to understand what the Word of God is saying when it it tells us to live perfectly before God, to not be under the dominion, the control of sin any longer in our life. And David sent to me a magazine. It was entitled Charisma. Some of you have read that magazine. In those days, the Charisma magazine had many articles that were written by a pastor from the Melbourne area, and his name was Jamie Buckingham. My brother-in-law, David, gave me this magazine and said, I believe you might be interested in what Jamie Buckingham 
has to say. As I looked into this article and began to read this article, I came to find out and to understand that Jamie Buckingham, Baptist pastor, I believe in his early years of ministry, had embarrassingly failed morally at least one time, maybe two times. I'm not sure. Any of the details. Doesn't matter. But as I read that article and I realized here is a man that is being very honest, very transparent. He's sharing about an embarrassing season in his life where he had failed, where he had sinned, and he was able to talk about this, and he was able to talk about the forgiveness that he had in Christ and the power of God that had delivered him and sustained him and had put him back on track. And I I remember thinking, what kind of a work of God is this in someone's life where they can talk about their failure? You see, I I would have preferred to have talked about success. I would have preferred to talk about strength. I, I sat under many pastors who shared from what sounded like a perfected life where there were no failures or weaknesses in their lives. And yet in my life, I realized that I fell so short of God's glory. As I looked at this, I began to study to find out What is the work of God in this man's life that this man can be so honest and transparent and yet be greatly used of God, as Jamie Buckingham was? And as I began to listen and read of his writings, I began to understand that he was writing about a spirit-filled and baptized life, really a Pentecost now experience. I became hungry for that kind of an experience. And uh, as, as I began to hunger for God and God's spirit and the power of God to be operative in my life, where I was surrendered to God in such a way that actually the will of God became the daily schedule and practice. Now, this I'm not talking about becoming perfect. I'm talking about having a heart that becomes perfectly fully surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. I'm not talking about someone who by works endeavors to please God. I'm talking about someone who realizes I could never please God, but God in me, Christ in me is the hope of glory and that God has a, has a desired gift, not only of salvation, but also of his Holy Spirit. This we Look to Pentecost Sunday as a remembrance of that day. But it's not to just celebrate a day 2,000 years ago. It is to celebrate the presence, the power, the desire of God to bring Pentecost now into the life of every believer. Is this possible? Absolutely, it's possible. Today, we're just looking at, at the possibility There's several other points that we will look at in the days that are ahead of us. But I I want you to understand from the Word of God that it is not only possible, it's the admonition of God that the work that only the Spirit of God can bring to pass is who you become on a daily basis. It is possible to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with His Spirit, and empowered to be a witness today. The possibility is absolute. The word is full of the promise. The second point is the promise, that God promises this. To whom? We're going to look at this in the word of God in the days ahead. We're going to look at the pursuit. What is my part? What is God's part? How do I get there? I know some people live their whole life and never sense that they grew toward this direction or had an experience with God in this kind of a way. In the future, we're going to talk about the possession, where God takes possession of your life and my life 
just as on the day of Pentecost, where a Peter who hours before, days before, had cursed and swore and fled on the day of Pentecost, Peter is now filled with the power of a living God. From that presence of the Holy Spirit, Peter would stand up, and as he stood up, the other disciples stood up, and they would minister on the day of Pentecost, and we know from the Scriptures that 3,000 people responded. That's a pretty great altar call and a pretty great awakening to take place in the city. Yes, this is the will of God. Not that I surrender my life, surrender my hands, surrender my mind, surrender my eyes, surrender my ears, surrender this body. Not that I surrender it to evil, but that I surrender my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm going to play a song at this time, and then I'm going to come right back and pray with you before we close. And if next Sunday, if, if the Flagler Center is opened up this next Sunday and we're able to get in, we will let our family know, those of you that we have your phone numbers and addresses. If you're listening and you don't have a church home of your own and you would like to come and worship with us, we plan to be uh, back in facilities very soon. We will be getting some kind of a report this coming week. So please feel free to give us a call. This next song is a song that's entitled Upon Him. And it's by Matt Redman. And I was blessed because we just came through resurrection season. And this song speaks of the power of the resurrection that's to be at work within us. Pray. 
shall come.